Hello and welcome to another edition of our Project Roscoe video series. In this video series, we're building and designing a 68030 based computer. And this video is about logic. And in particular, how we're going to build and implement the logic that we need to make everything work together. Now the 68030 has a not terribly complex, but there's some options in how the bus cycle works. And we're gonna to interface to a network controller, a USB, DRAM, SRAM, we need to do DRAM refresh. So we have a lot of things going on. So we're gonna to need to do a bit of logic. And so the question is, how are you gonna do it? And if you look on the internet at other 68030 based computers that are sort of being done today, many of them will use an FPGA. And the advantage of using an FPGA is that's a pretty compact form that packs in a lot of logic and a lot of logic power in a single place. You could have one FPGA probably do all of the logic decoding we need to do. Uh, and this example on the screen here, we have this uh, Tryon FPGA, which is made by Ethernix. Uh, and it's an interesting FPGA in part because it comes in a quad flat pack package still. So a relatively easy to hand solder package. Many FPGAs are ball grid array, which is relatively unfriendly to the home enthusiast uh, hand solderer. But there, the Tryon is one that does come in a, a pretty easy to solder package. Uh, the only downside is that the Tryon is only a 3.3 volt part. In fact, of almost all the FPGAs made, most are either 1.2 or 1.8, and then there are some that are 3.3. Um, certainly, there are no FPGAs left in current modern production that are 5 volt. And so we could do it with 3.3. We need to have level converters for virtually every signal in the computer, every signal from the CPU, certainly. And the same is true from the uh, DRAM. So feasible, but it involves doing a lot of level conversion. And the, the second really downside of the FPGA is that it will be developed in a language like VHDL or Verilog. And those languages are extremely powerful, but they're just complicated enough that if you haven't used them, there's a little bit of a learning curve to be able to understand what the design is doing. So FPGAs are great. And if you were gonna make a board for production, you would certainly use an FPGA, but we're gonna skip out using the FPGA and instead go a slightly different route. Uh, and that route is, is that we're going to use some programmable logic devices. Now, when I say PLD, that's a term that is uh, both really old school, and then there are, there are some recent uh, PLDs called CPLDs that are more complex. Um, sort of the old school PLD from back in the late 80s is the 22V10, and there's one called the 16L8. Um, these were super popular for building things. They came in, you can see a, a dip form factor and you could flash them with a relatively inexpensive flasher. And internally, they could represent uh, both a combination of logic and some flip-flops. In the case of the name, the 22V10, that represents that it had 22 pins that were usable, of which 10 were input and output pins. Uh, and in the case of the 22V10, it also means it has 10 flip-flops. In fact, there's a picture here of uh, sort of the, the internal architecture and you can see the output pins, they all have one of these little macro cells that goes with the output pin. And that macro cell contains in it a single flip-flop and some little bit of logic. And the input to that flip-flop and that little logic block uh, is a collection of OR lines or OR gates, then coming from a bunch of AND gates. And so this array here is an array where you can pick any of the input pins and AND them all together. And the idea is that if you look here, you can see a little eight there. So that means that there's eight different connections that can come out of this AND array and be OR together. And so fundamentally, the PLDs can make an expression. You can say, I want this pin to be equal to this and this and this AND it together, or this and this and this and this AND it together, or this and this and this and this AND it together, and an expression of those. And it turns out that a, a collection of ANDs and ORs in that order combined together can build relatively complex expressions. Um, you could take an expression and write it out and basically compact it down to that form where it's a bunch of things, signals and it together and then those or together. And so they're pretty flexible. You can, you can use them for things like address decoding or sequencing logic. Uh, and they were a really neat way to do it. And in fact, if we look at, let's take a look at our top can here. So this is a, an original Macintosh 128K motherboard. So from the very early Macintosh. Uh, and it's, interesting to look at because you can see here the Motorola 68000 and then there's a chipper called the WAS machine which implemented the floppy disk controller and then there's a little serial UART and then a little um, uh, via input output chip that's used for driving input output pins for like some devices 
And these really are the only four chips on here that are sort of complex VLSI um, devices. Then you have the ROM here, and the RAM is over here, and then the rest is logic. And one of the things they did in this device is you'll see here is a chip labeled um, HAL 16 R8, and there's a couple of other 16 R8 and a 16 L8. And these are PLDs. They're just like that 22V10. Um, and these were programmed by Apple to do some of the logic. And if they didn't have these available, they would have used just normal logic gates, but the board would have been quite a bit bigger. So one of the key things behind making this fit this form factor was their use of these uh, PLDs. And so you'll see in this era computer, PLDs were sort of used in the early days as a way to build complex logic. Now, if you look at, so here's a board from a SE, uh, Macintosh SE, so much newer. Um, you can see it still had the 68,000. And in fact, the VIA is here and the UART is here. It does have a SCSI controller added, but there's a far less chips, by the way. And the reason that's true is because all of that logic from both the PLDs and other things in the board were compacted into a custom ASIC that Apple had produced. And so now this board has this chip on it that you, you couldn't buy. It's a, a chip made for Apple Custom that has all their logic in it. And so, you know, the evolution was that you had the PLDs were programmable and were a great choice for building uh, a computer. And then eventually you got complex enough and big enough that you would have someone make an ASIC to implement uh, the particular logic that you need to implement. But for us, though, we're going to try uh, the PLD route. And in particular, we're going to use um, a CPLD, so a more complex version. And we're going to use one called the ATF-1508. And this is a chip made by Microchip. And it's been produced by them for, I think, more than 20 years, maybe 24, 25 years. So it's a chip that's been around for a long time. They are still producing it today. Uh, it comes in a variety of form factors, both a, this is a service mount um, flat pack format. It also comes in a PLCC format, which is a sort of convenient one because you can make that in a through hole socket. Uh, but best of all is it's a five volt part. So it is a PLD that you can program and it's programmed over JTAG. So it's really easy to program. And it really is kind of like a big 22 V10. And you can see here, it says 128 MCs. And that's because it has 128 macro cells. So 128 flip flops, um, with 128 little connections to that logic array. And in this case, this one has a hundred pins with about 80 that are usable for IO. So it has more internal flip-flops than pins, which is helpful because you can use that for things like state machines. And I think I have a picture here of the, of what a single macro cell looks like. And sure enough, it, it has a flip-flop. It's kind of the heart of it. And then a bunch of gates to pick where things come from. And then it's connected to a logic array of both and signals eventually, and then a bunch of ors together. And you know, this macro cell, is what you can configure and each macro cell is unique. It can be configured differently and you can use a macro cell and actually not tie it to the output pin, but use it internally. So you can chain macro cells together to get complex logic. Uh, and it's a very flexible device um, that allows you to have sort of somewhat complex logic in a form factor that's pretty easy to hand solder. Uh, and it's what we're gonna use to do all of our logic. Now, the other thing you gotta think about is, well, how do you, how do you program it? What do you, what do you write this stuff in? And the PLDs, both the PLDs from the Macintosh, that 16 uh, R8 or the 22 V10 and the ATF 1508, uh, they use a language called Couple, which is sort of a successor to a language called Able. And you know, here's a sort of a sample of what Couple looks like. And probably the best part about Couple is just that it's very, very simple. You define pins. So, you know, this signal name is on this pin. And then you can write equations. You can say, well, this pin, I want to be equal to this expression. And it's, you know, this signal ended with the inverse of this signal. Uh, you know, you can have multiple signals. In this case, you have a, a, a set of three of them up here. Um, you know, you can also define the flip-flop. So this is a flip-flop with the D input set to some pin and the clock input set to another expression. And so, probably the best part about couple is that it's it's really easy to just read and there's not a lot of complexity to it. There are a few language features that we're going to use. I call them language features. They're things like there are these things called fields, which allows you to take a bunch of different inputs or pins and put them all together and then 
be able to say, I want these fields to all be equal to some value. So it's a way to like do decoding easier and make the code a little more compact. But once you sort of understand that one thing, everything else is really straightforward. So it's a really good language for a project like this because you will be able to look at the couple code as we develop it and have it make complete sense to you. You could read the code and draw out on paper the logic, like it's an AND gate and then an OR gate and maybe an XOR and then a flip-flop, uh, all from the, the text of the couple file. And you take the couple file and you basically compile it using a tool called WinCouple, which is a somewhat terrible tool, but it does work. Uh, and it generates uh, a JDEC file that you then basically flash over JTAG on the board to the device. And so the best part is if you have a bug, which we're certainly going to have, you can fix it and then just reflash the device on the board. And I've used the CPLDs for a lot of different projects in part because they're five volt compatible uh, and they're still available in some really easy to sort of hand solder form factor. Um, they're pretty fast. The ones we ha we're using are um, 7.5 nanoseconds. So in terms of a project like this for the 60 or 30, running at either 20 or 30 or 40 megahertz, uh, that is a device fast enough to do things like address decode and even fast enough to be able to do the decode necessary for that synchronous bus cycle. And so it's a relatively easy part to use. And as far as someone watching this video, it's by far the easiest to understand. The couple code will write, we can put in comments that explains it and you can probably look at it and go, oh, that makes sense. Yeah, that needs to be that signal and with that signal. And it makes it kind of easy to follow. And so that's what we're gonna use. Um, you know, you can buy these parts uh, new on uh, DigiKey and Mauser, so they're they're relatively available, which is a great thing. Uh, and I mentioned that WinCouple is a tool, it's a Windows tool for compiling uh, the couple format and then generating the JDEC file. And so we'll do a little look into that later. Um, I will do a separate video as an introduction to couple, because there are a few language things that we might use that are just make things a little easier to do. Uh, and so we'll do a little video sort of walking through Couple. If you've never looked at it before, um, you can watch that and it's not very complicated to understand. But with that in mind, so now that we sort of know, we're going to use some CPLDs to do the logic and we'll probably need two, maybe three of them, depending on how much complexity we have. Uh, that kind of sets the stage for the next video being something where we are going to start the logic design. So we'll start figuring out, well, how do you hook up the CPU? What do you hook it up to? How does it talk to memory? And start going through each of the different peripherals and selecting the part and you know designing the actual schematic. And so stay tuned for the next episode when we'll get that logic design started up.